All right, tip number one, use oil when you're using your welding skills to build a project and uh, you know you gotta drill through something. Basically, if you use a good quality thread cutting oil when you're drilling your holes, it will work to greatly extend the life of your drill bit, it keeps things cool, and it just makes the cutting process go so much easier. In a related matter, I've had really good luck with this Ote brand dark thread cutting oil. This was actually recommended to me by a pipeliner friend of mine, and I've been using it ever since, and it's great. This is a 16 ounce bottle of made in USA oil. It costs like $4 at Lowe's, and this will last me for a good year or a year and a half. Plus, it probably pays for itself in drill bits it saves. Tip number two when you're drilling through metal, you're gonna to wanna to keep your RPMs down. You know, it's not wood, it's not plastic, it's not PVC, it's not whatever. Drilling through steel, really any metal, metals in general, let's put it that way, requires a lower number of RPMs and a higher amount of torque than wood, plastic, you know, whatever. And uh, you know, if you take a regular conventional household corded drill or cordless or whatever you prefer, and you just pull this trigger all the way in, spool the thing up, and plow into a piece of metal, you're gonna absolutely destroy the drill bit. It's gonna be a really bad time. And uh, so just in general, if possible, I recommend using a good drill press or a mag drill or a low RPM drill like this. But even if you just have like a regular standard corded cordless drill, that's what I used to use. Uh, you know, if you keep your RPMs down, things are gonna go a lot better for you. Tip number three, label your angle grinder wrenches. There's probably a more technical term for these things. But regardless, once you acquire a few angle grinders, you're of course gonna acquire an assortment of these things, and having them labeled will save you time when you go to switch out grinding wheels. Tip number four, get a preferably metal trash can with a tight fitting lid. Why? Because even in a normal welding shop, you're probably gonna amass some stuff that's kinda flammable. Think packaging, paper, that type of stuff. You know, we got some cardboard in here, uh, receipt from something I bought, you know, just not the kind of thing you want to be shooting plasma cutter sparks or whatever into. And so, I like to contain it with this. It's obviously nice and tight, but mainly, don't leave stuff like that laying around, and uh, also you're going to want to keep this empty as soon as possible, and you know, just be really careful. But this has got to be a lot better than using an open trash can, or making a pile on the floor, or whatever. Tip number five, well tip number five starts off with a question, and please feel free to answer this honestly. Ladies and gentlemen, do you ever tack things wrong? You know, you don't line it up quite right, you don't position it quite right, or you do and then the heat of the tack pulls it off to the side a little bit? Well, luckily, this never happens to me. But when it does, I use this pipe wrench here. Tip number five is buy a ginormous pipe wrench. This thing is 36 inches and cheap pipe wrenches are, well, surprisingly cheap. Having one around will give you a lot of added leverage when the time comes, and it's just, it's one of the things that I didn't really think about when I first got into welding, and now I'm really glad I have this. Tip number six is to use a piece of scrap metal to keep your hand, wrist, elbow, arm, what have you, off of whatever is hot. Let's say that this piece of plate here, which is my tabletop, was really my workpiece. Let's say I was welding on this. It was getting pretty toasty, and I had to weld over here. Now what I could do, Simply take my lead and position myself like such, but the bottom of this glove is going to get really hot really fast. What can you do? Simply put a piece of scrap metal here, rest the glove on the scrap metal, and weld away. Tip number seven. Buy yourself a ginormous pry bar. I got this thing from Lowe's as well. It's pretty cheap, and uh, well, the reason why I got it is pretty much the same reason I got the pipe wrench. It gives you a lot of added leverage when you need a lot of added leverage. Tip number eight. Keep your head out of the fumes when you're welding. Because I kind of suck at this, but I'm working on it. Uh, yeah, so basically most welding helmets have a round, bulbous kind of a shape. And the cool thing about this is that smoke will generally go around them, but some of the smoke kind of rolls up underneath your chin. And I didn't really realize how bad this could be when you don't really realize how bad it is. For instance, I'd be welding something, I'm like, oh, there's still a load of smoke in here. And I'd film it, of course, because while I make YouTube videos, and then I'd watch the footage, and my head would just be in this huge plume of smoke. And, you know, that's when you realize that there is a little bit coming up under here. So, you know, it pays off to make a conscious effort, keep your head back. Like, if I was going to weld this joint right here, you know, just kind of lean back here or something. And, uh, you know, just, it might extend your life expectancy a little bit. Tip number nine, use one arm slash hand to brace your other arm slash hand 
when you're welding stuff. Why? Because someone once told me that the ABCs of welding are always be comfortable and when you're steady you make much better and much better looking welds than when you're not and you're going all over the place and you're as shaky as can be. So simply what I do is I'll rest my elbow on something, hold this hand with the stinger with the hand attached to my yonder elbow and just like that I'm twice as steady, at least, I don't know, and I get much better results. I highly recommend this practice. Tip number 10 relates to the storage of angle grinders, more specifically their cords. Now as mentioned, once you've been welding for a little while, you're probably going to acquire an assortment of probably four and a half, five inch angle grinders, and they of course come with cords, and cords get kind of tangled up, and they just, it's something you really want to keep organized, and here's how I keep my angle grinder cords organized. The way I wrap these up is I'll just take this loop and put it up around the side thing and you want to be careful that you're not really bending this part of the cord because if you do it'll start to fatigue here. So I'll give this a little bit of extra space, you know like that. And ah, it's hard to do this on camera, pretty much just wrap it like such. Now everybody has their own preference on how to do this, but this is what I do and I've been welding for five years and using angle grinders the whole time and I've never had to replace the cord on one. Tip number 11 is to buy a good quality respirator. I really like these 3M units. This is actually my second one. You know, my first one I used it for years and when I moved down here to Texas, it wasn't really worth the move because they're kind of nasty. But the cool thing about these is they go on real easy and they fit underneath a welding helmet. Kind of like such, and uh, this is a nice added layer of protection if you have to weld something painted or you know, you're know you not in a well ventilated area or with the right filters if you're welding some galvanized or, or what have you. There's a lot of things this can protect you from and for the approximately $30 price tag online, I really think it's a good investment. Tip number 12, when you're going to build a shelf, consider building it from expanded metal or metal mesh. Simply because a lot of things like an angle grinder and a wire brush won't fall through, but all this crap that's down here on my floor, bits of slag and dust and whatnot, well they go straight through. Now that's the main advantage. The main disadvantage is that things like silver pencils and sharpies and MIG tips also go straight through, so you're going to want to keep that in mind, and thus this isn't really a one-size-fits rule, but regardless, it's something you might want to consider. Tip number 13 deals with striking an electrode that really isn't in the mood to be struck. Basically, when you're running a 7018 or any number of other primarily low hydrogen stick electrodes, sometimes you'll get a little ball of slag that forms over the steel part of the electrode itself. And this is just caused by, well it's just molten slag and that's how it forms when you stop welding or when you try to strike it and you try it a few times and it's not your day and it's not striking. What do you do about that? Well, with gloves on, you know, assuming your welder is turned on or even plugged in for that matter. I think mine's plugged in. But when you're actually welding, you're going to want to wear gloves of course. And what you do is you just take this and put it up against a rough surface. You can use a file, a concrete floor, a piece of steel with some rust on it and just and that should work to pop that little bulb of slag off of there and then when you go to strike your electrode well you'll have bare exposed metal which can of course complete the electronical circuit that is the technical term for it by the way and hopefully you'll be back to welding tip number 14 buy yourself a Swanson Speed Square yeah this is a 12 inch variety I actually have a uh, smaller 6 inch one as well here. These things are great for any kind of general purpose fabrication because you can put them up against something and draw a straight line and there's this little lip here which is going to catch on the side of whatever you're marking on so that helps to keep things nice and straight and it's a triangle of course so you know you can put a 45 degree line as well and they do a number of other cool things. Long story short I have two of these I don't know where I'd be without them. Tip number 15 I think. I hope. <laughs> When you buy a new power tool and it comes in a hard plastic case, you might want to bust out your cell phone and take a picture of things as they sit in the case when you first open it. Simply because if there's you know accessories or whatnot, batteries, side handles, what have you, it can be hard to fit everything in there just right, especially when you don't know how it's supposed to go. So if you have that picture, you can just refer back to it and tell yourself, all right, this goes here and that goes there, and this goes, wait, this isn't even for this tool. You know, it can save you a little bit of time. Tip number 16 is to remove spatter and to remove BBs. 
Now, I find that a good old slag chip and hammer works really well for this, you know, especially with that flat point right there. And this isn't something that I ever really used to do, and a bunch of people online would always yell at me for it, and they're like, this is all gonna look that much better. And then I would, and I'm like, well, that looks a lot better. I wish I'd done this in the first place. You know, if you take a moment or two and clean up the area right around your welds, you, you know, whatever it is you did is gonna look a lot more professional, and your customer's probably gonna like it a little bit better. Or if you're gonna paint it for yourself and keep it later on, maybe you'll even like it a little bit better. So long story short, I recommend spending a few extra seconds and uh, cleaning up the area around your well. Tip number 17, paint things. <laughs> when you're working on a project for someone else or a project for yourself, well, this kind of goes hand in hand with that last tip. And you know, welding, repair, and fabrication isn't just about welding, repair, and fabrication. To an extent, it's an appearance-based business and you want things to look their best when you take them back to people. If you have, you know, bare metal and uh, that smoky residue and fried paint around it, it's not really going to look so good. If you spend a few extra minutes and you take, you know, your chip and hammer and you knock off the BBs and you take a wire wheel on an angle grinder and you smooth off the uh, burned off paint, knock the smoke off of there and whatnot, and then paint it, it's going to look a lot better. Your customer's probably going to like it a lot better. Uh, everyone's going to be happy. This also is something that I never really used to do, but I never used to do it because I'm really cheap and I was like, oh, paint costs money. I ain't got money for that, even though I did. And, uh, you know, when you, when you really think about it, it doesn't really cost much. If it's a smaller job, let's say you buy 50 bucks worth of steel, you charge a person another 20, 30 bucks for having to go get the steel, and then 100 bucks for putting it back together, you know, and it's a small project, it's going to it's like five or ten bucks worth of spray paint at best and it looks so so much better I highly recommend that you paint stuff when you're done with it and also once you do this a little bit you end up with you know just cans of paint laying around properly stored of course and then it seemingly costs you even less so that's just something to keep in mind tip number 18 don't cheap out on safety glasses. Why? Because, as you've probably heard a million and one times, you only get one set of eyes. So there's that, and also there's the fact that, in my experience, if you get the good quality safety glasses, not only do they perform a lot better, but they last a lot longer, and if you know where to look, they're probably going to be cheaper than buying, you know, the cheapies at a big box store. And, uh, so that's the route I recommend going. Whatever you get, don't get the El Cheapo ones because really bad things can happen. Also, one last thing I want to add to this, these glasses, even though they're clear, will protect you from harmful UV light when you're welding if you accidentally flash yourself or someone flashes you or whatever happens. Now, I know that they pretty much all say they're UV rated, but with a lot of the cheaper ones I've used, they say that, and then my eyes hurt a lot more than when I flash myself wearing these or other really good quality safety glasses. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Tip number 19, weld from the outside in. Now, let's say I was welding this like I did earlier, and uh, basically what I mean by this is that if I was to weld from the inside out on something shaped like this or anything that's even remotely similar, what's going to happen is as I'm welding along, heat's going to build and it's going to build and it's going to build. And by the time I get here, it's going to be really, really hard to make a good stop without either burning through or having undercut or just plain running way too hot. Because we're building all this heat and there's nowhere for it to go, so it's just going to condense up around here. It's going to be a lot harder. Thus, what I recommend is starting here and, well, welding in because this way as heat builds it goes towards the larger part of the piece of metal and you just don't have that problem. Now it's worth noting that yes I know that is a cold start but there's a tack there and this is just a shelf that's going to hold some welding gloves or maybe a box of electrodes so it's going to be okay but really when you have a cold start like this well the way to prevent a cold start like this when you have a tack like that is to grind it down a little bit first so you're not melting all that excess metal. That's just a little bonus tip. Tip number 20, clean your metal before you weld it. Now I'm sure we've all heard, oh, you can stick weld through a foot of cow crap. Oh, you should have bothered wasting your time cleaning metal if you're gonna stick weld it. And my opinion on that is that you really kind of should. <laughs> because, you know, when you've got a bunch of oil, grease, paint, powder coat, whatever, and you weld over it, it doesn't go away, it has to go somewhere. Now, most commonly, it'll go up in smoke and then enter into your nose and lungs and body and cause potentially irreversible health damage later on down the road. But, 
you know, not only that, it's also going to go into your weld, especially galvanization. If you weld something galvanized, your weld is going to be entirely more brittle than it would be if you bothered to clean it up, for instance. And to be fair, some processes are much more tolerant of this than others. With TIG welding, as you know, you really shouldn't even have mill scale or anything on there. You have to get it spotlessly clean. MIG tolerates a little bit of mill scale, maybe a little, little bit of some other stuff. And with stick, well, that's where the saying comes from. Now, this reminds me of when I started trap shooting last summer. And it reminded me of all those people who were like, oh, you can't miss with a shotgun. You kind of can. <laughs> And uh, so, long story short, I recommend cleaning things before you actually try to weld them. Now, if you just can't get something clean, because as we all know, it happens. I think I might have pulled a muscle when I made that goofy laugh a few seconds ago. Uh, where is I going with this? Oh yeah, right. If you absolutely can't get things clean, I would highly, highly recommend running 6010 or 6011 or something that I used to do occasionally in these situations is run 6010 or 6011 because that's the best at burning through stuff. And then once you have that down, you know, the oil's been vaporized, the paint, powder coat, whatever has been burned and it's really coming up really easily. You know, you can just take a wire brush and wire brush it and then maybe it'll be clean enough to run something like 7018 over. But for the millionth time, I don't recommend this. I really, really, really recommend getting things as clean as you can before you weld them. Tip number 21, earplugs. Why? Because a lot of welding related activities like uh, plasma cutting, carbon arc gouging, running a grinder, or any number of other power tools are, well, loud. <laughs> They're really loud at times. Sometimes even louder than other times. And you really want to take steps to protect your sense of hearing because just like your sense of vision, well, once it's gone, it's not coming back. Now, I'm sure you've heard this from a number of people. And it's, there's some folks out there that just don't wear hearing protection when they do things because either they're already half deaf or you know they, they just don't like to wear the big earmuffs or they just they think they're invincible or whatever and I'm not gonna be that guy that's like you should do this for your own good I need to protect you from yourself what I am saying is consider the consequences of not using hearing protection and consider how easy and comfortable a proper fitting pair of earplugs is to acquire and use. I got, I believe, 200 or 250 sets of good quality earplugs online shipped to my door for less than 30 bucks and that's going to last me for, I don't know, probably over a year. Uh, you know, it's a really small price to pay and the cool thing is with earplugs, it's not like big bulky earmuffs which get in the way of things. You know, you put your earplugs in, you forget about them, you can wear a welding helmet, a face shield, whatever, and it, it just doesn't get in the way. So, long story short, if you're going to not protect your hearing, at least know what you're getting yourself into and what you can do to avoid that. And if you want to make your own decision, you know, at the end of the day, it's your ears. But I recommend good earplugs. Tip number 22 talks about grinding wheels. Now, as you can see, I've got here a flap disc, which, as the name implies, is just flaps of sandpaper attached to a, in this case, plastic disc. And this, which is a hard abrasive wheel, which is just hard abrasive material shaped like a wheel. <laughs> now these are two different tools with two different purposes and while their purposes can overlap sometimes, what I recommend doing is using your hard abrasive wheels to remove the bulk of the material when you're trying to grind a weld down or grind something down to a specified size or what have you simply because these are cheap er than these. You know, if you go to like Lowe's or Home Depot or whatever, this will probably run you three to four dollars. This is probably going to be seven or eight. Also, this will last longer and remove a lot of material very quickly. The downside is that it removes a lot of material. So if you're just going to be, you know, like taking paint or powder coat or whatever off of something to weld it, you might be better served with these. And something else to keep in mind is a lot of the time when you grind something with a hard abrasive wheel, it doesn't leave a smooth surface. This leaves a smooth, a smoother surface. Maybe it'll be a little bit wavy if you really went overboard, but overall it'll leave a better looking finish than this. And uh, you know, once you're really skilled, the finish this leaves gets a lot better, but that's how I do things and that's what I recommend. This could possibly save you quite a bit of money, quite a bit of time. Tip number 23 is to get good at running 7018. Now a few years ago when I first started stick welding, I was completely and totally overwhelmed by the plethora of different types and classifications of stick electrodes out there. And I wish now that I had someone then that was like, 
use 7018 and get good with it. Now, I don't want to start a uh, stick electrode war in the comments section of this or anything. That's not what I'm going for here, but what I am going for is that, well, there's three main things that I want to get across, which is why you really should get to learn to use 7018. First is, it performs really well out of position. Now, I realize that running 7018 in the flat position, if, if you've never done it before, has a little bit of a learning curve. It's not as easy to strike as most of the other stick electrodes. It's hard to re-strike. Just, it just feels different when you're welding with it. But once you get used to it, it grows on you, and then once you start doing more advanced stuff like vertical and overhead, it feels pretty natural. So there's that. The second reason is probably by far the biggest reason, and that is that 7018 is what's referred to as a low hydrogen electrode. To put it simply, what that means is that if you weld something with 7018 and it takes a big jolt or a big hit or suffers an impact, it's more likely to bend a little bit before it breaks, or a lot before it breaks, than a joint that was welded with another stick electrode, which is going to be a little bit more brittle because it's not a low hydrogen electrode, and it's just going to break and fail potentially catastrophically. So for this reason, you get reason number three, which is 7018 is incredibly commonly used. What else is commonly used? Other types of low hydrogen electrodes, which are all going to run very, very, very much like 7018. So if you're practicing now to get into welding as a career, you're probably going to be working for someone, and if they have you stick welding, it's probably going to be with 7018. You know, if you're doing pipeline work, for instance, which pays stupid money, you know, that's a root pass of 6010 or 8010, and then 7018 or 9018 or 118 or another type of low hydrogen electrode. So for that reason, I recommend that you start off with it now. Again, I don't want to start a stick electrode war. I know everyone has their preferences, and for a lot of things, the other electrodes are just fine, but 7018 is commonly used, and so for that reason, I think that's probably what you should uh, familiarize yourself with once you get the chance. Tip number 24 is a face shield. I highly, highly, highly recommend purchasing one of these. Why? Because this offers you infinitely more protection than these do. Don't get me great. Don't, yeah, don't get me great. That's what it is. Don't get me wrong. These are great. There we go. But this, you know, it's just, it's, it's night and day. This protects. A few square inches of your face, this protects your entire face. What's ideal is if you can combine these two like such, especially when you're grinding or whatnot, because I've seen, luckily not firsthand, but I've seen pictures of what happens when grinding wheels fly apart. They embed in people's faces, absolutely horrible, horrible things happen, and also if you've ever had a piece of metal in your eye, you know how much it totally sucks. That I have, unfortunately, experienced firsthand, and I wouldn't have if I'd been wearing a face shield at the time. This is a fiber metal brand face shield. I really like it. It was like 30, 40 bucks online. I've had it for a couple years. I use it more than ever, and I wish I had it since I first started welding. So again, if you can spare a few bucks, I highly recommend picking up a good face shield. Tip number 25, gussets. Use them. <laughs> Why? Because a gusset, as you know, is a triangular brace, which you put it, it doesn't have to be a 90 degree angle, but you put where two pieces of material meet, and it takes a lot of stress off the weld where those two pieces of material meet, and at the end of the day, it's a very small piece of metal which takes an absolutely minimal amount of metal, an amount of skill, an amount of time to create, and again, it does make your finished product infinitely infinitely stronger. Learning about gussets and the magic of them and why and how to use them is one of the best things that ever happened to me in terms of fabrication knowledge and I don't think hardly any of the things I've built throughout the few years I've been doing this would be as good or as strong as they are if I hadn't used gussets. Again, minimal effort, maximum results. I highly recommend using gussets. Tip number 26 involves a little bit of terminology and this right here. Now, here's a little bit of background. Back in the good old days of the first chunk of the 1900s, if you were going to weld something, you just, you really didn't have that many options. In fact, you probably just had two. You could weld it with a torch, you could oxyacetylene weld it, you could torch weld it, gas weld it, whatever the terminology that you're most comfortable with. You know, you could do that, or you could use this, which at the time was state-of-the-art, mind-blowingly advanced technology. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, I give you the shield and metal arc welding process. Now, I'm going with this, is back in the day, this was the only 
common type of electrical arc welding. Now there's over 60 different types and uh, you know we all know the common ones, shielded metal arc or stick, you know MIG, TIG, flux core. There's a whole lot more out there, there's plasma, there's electron beam, what have you. But where I'm going with this is that there's now multiple kinds of electric arc welding and so it would be much better, I think, if you didn't refer to this as arc welding. I know that when I hear someone say, oh, look at this trailer that I just arc welded, I cringe a little bit, either on the inside or on the outside, or most of the time, both. And I know it's not just me, I know a lot of people are like this as well. And with the term arc welding referring to this right here, it's not like it's push versus pull MIG welding. It's not like there's a huge debate where there's a bunch of people that are like, no, it's definitely arc welding and this is why. A lot of the time it's just a term that was once 100% accurate, but now not so much. It's just passed down generation through generation, and I think it's more prevalent in some parts of the country than others. But regardless, uh, know that there's multiple different types of electric arc welding now that are available and thus uh, you know I feel like you'd probably be a lot better off if you called the stick welding or something like that please just don't call it arc welding now I don't want to be that guy that's like oh look at what I know it's so much better than everyone else because I know this because that's not what I'm going for what I'm going for is it's not a proper term it makes people cringe this isn't instinctive knowledge someone has to tell you this and I'm trying to be that someone and I'm trying to do it nicely so again, to help yourself, please call this not arc welding. Our next tip, the one that I hope is number 27, also relates to terminology. To put it simply, there's no such thing as gasless MIG or flux core MIG. Now, to be fair, there is gas shield core welding, which someone could argue is, you know, MIG flux core or flux core MIG, but overall, People refer to self shielded wire as gasless MIG, which it's not, or some other term. There's a variety of these train wreck intermingling, not going well terms that are out there. And this is generally not the fault of the people who use these terms. The way it works, the way these terms come to be is that over in a certain country on the opposite side of the world where things are commonly built for a very low price point, well, when you go to build a wire feed welder, you know, you need a place for a spool to go, you need something to feed the wire, you need something to feed the wire through, and you need a gun for it to poke out the other end of. And if you have that, along with a power source, you can run self-shielded flux core wire. And the advantage of this is it's really cheap to build these machines. So what happens is companies build these machines and they sell them to companies who sell them here in the US and in North America in general and in Europe and elsewhere, of the, elsewhere across the world. And who buys these machines? Not welders, not fabricators. Companies buy these and they stick their logo on the side and then they sell them and when this is going on It's being done by people who aren't welders. They don't fully understand the terminology All they know is they can buy this for X number of dollars put their logo on it Sell it for Y number of dollars more than X and that's that and that's how you end up with terms like flux core MIG or gasless MIG That's the big one. I mean as mentioned, you know gas shielded flux core. That's a thing but where I'm going with this is don't, please don't call self-shielded flux core wire gasless MIG because it's not. MIG stands for metal inert gas. There's no gas, it's not MIG. <laughs> Again, this isn't really the fault of the people that use the terms commonly, but it happens. And it's, it's just a little thing, but it's something that I feel like people should, uh, should know. So I'm just trying to tell you guys, basically. Alright YouTube, so it's getting kind of late in the evening, and it's getting kind of late in the video. In fact, we are now, I drank that water pretty fast, we are now at the last tip in this video, number 28, which is in and of itself pretty simple, but uh, in fact it's only one word. That is, you've got to practice and practice and practice. I'm gonna just go ahead and pop the lid off the old cool story jar here real quick and I'm gonna try to dig through my computer and find the first welding repair that I ever did in my entire life. This picture is from sometime in the summer of 2009. It's probably from June or July and this is of a tongue that was on a wagon, like a little garden tractor wagon, you know, you pull behind a lawnmower or whatever, at my mom's farm up in Ohio. And I don't 
really remember what it, what the problem was, but for whatever reason, this seemed to be the solution for it at the time. <laughs> That's right, ladies and gentlemen, this fine display of metalworking ability is the first real welding that I took on. It's a small project, now I could do it infinitely better in like 10 minutes. The only thing, where I'm going with this, is the only thing that's different for me in 2009 to me now here in late April 2014 as I'm filming this is a lot of practice and a little bit of instruction and to be fair I did get a better stick welder. That the Hobart stick made over there was the first decent welder I ever, first decent stick welder I ever had. And uh, you know when I welded that tongue I used an old AC225 that I bought off a of Craigslist and uh, you know it's a bare bones welder but that is a pretty good machine for what it is. But I, I honestly think that there was something wrong with mine. You know, looking back on it in hindsight, knowing now what I didn't know then, I really think there was something messed up with that welder. Now I know, I know. Blame the tool, blame the tool. But I'm, I don't know. I sold it, so there's not really a lot I can do. But yeah, that could possibly explain some of this. Now my favorite part about this picture is, uh, you know, if, if you look, you'll see where I was presumably welding with an electrode stub and it stuck. So. So I just left it there. <laughs> yeah, it's sticking out the side. And uh, you know, it feels kind of weird to post this on the internet, but I guess I kind of ran out of shame at some point earlier on in my dating life. So now you guys get to enjoy this awesome picture. And uh, regardless, like I said before, the only thing in the change between then and now is the amount of practice I had and a little bit of instruction. And now, you know, I'll meet people or I'll get messages from people that are like, you know, I'm just getting started out. I, I wish there was some, I wish I could do what you do and make welds that pretty and, you know, have a 6G certification and TIG weld and walk the cup and weld vertical and overhead and all these things which people say are really, really hard, but, the, you know, you can. This is where I started. This is probably behind where a lot of people get started welding. And, uh, you know, again, the only thing that really changes is practice. The first time I ever TIG welded, the first time I ever welded 5G, the first time I ever did pretty much anything welding related, I totally and completely sucked at it. I mean, the results are, well, I guess this picture says enough about that, but you know, it's, it's just practice. The first time you do something, nothing went well for me at all, but the second time I do something, ideally with a little bit of instruction, I'd be like, okay, so that's, that's what I did wrong. I'll just, I'll do this, I'll do it a little bit differently. Hopefully things will come out a little bit better. And they do, and then you do it again, and you're like, all right, I think I see what I need to do here. And you do it again, and you're like, all right, I'm finally starting to get the hang of this. And uh, I think you're probably not when you reach that point. I mean, I shouldn't put that out there. But regardless, you keep doing it until you actually do get the hang of it, and then you can do it really well. And uh, five years go by and you collect some certifications and then 40,000 people watch you well. But, or wherever you want to take it. If you want to work on the pipelines and make stupid good money, if you want to do custom fabrication and make doom buggies and roll cages and all that cool stuff. The opportunities really are endless and welding is something that you get out of it, what you put into it. So, in summary, if you're like, I really want to know how to weld. I want to make attractive welds. That was my thing when I first started going. I didn't want to make things that look like that. I wanted to make things that look like, you know, a good 7018 weld on something. You know, that's what I was going for. And whatever your goal is, the only way you're going to get there is to practice it and practice it and practice it. So on that note, I hope that these tips have uh, given you all something to think about. Maybe you learned something which will save you some money, frustration, pain, suffering, what have you. And to wind things down, just practice. Practice all your welds and uh, have fun out there. So thanks for watching, everybody. Don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe for more. Have a nice night, everybody. Yeehaw.